You're listening to the Conversate Cast. I'm Everett Verossi, and this is Discourse to Elevate the Community and Culture. This platform is born of the idea that storytelling and conversation is a powerful tool for self development, and our vision is good chat, better banter, and plenty of gems with individuals who have testimonies that will empower and provide blueprints for our community to keep growing. You're here with Zebby on the Conversate Cast, skinny good riding shotgun again today. I think it's the author Tom Watts that said that the way you do anything is the way that you do everything. And I've observed this man for many years, the different seasons of his journey, and have always reveled and admired the grace and humility that he shows when navigating all the twists and turns that come with pursuing a goal. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest today. I believe every story has power to empower and their experiences will resonate with many people from our community. He's a friend to the room. Welcome to the Conversate cast, Sarafu Fatiaki. What's up, brother? What's up, bro? Thanks for having me. What did you think of the intro? You got a way out of (laughs) sense. It was good, I'm surprised you could say that all in one sentence, bro. Yeah, I know, I took a couple of breaths, but I know you're a big community man, King of St. Clair Comets. Uh, but for those that don't know you, would you be able to tell us a little bit about your story and yourself? Just what brought you to Sydney? You weren't born in Australia. Yeah, man, fresh fresh off the boat. Uh, <laughs> I come from a small island called Rutuma, which is a part of Fiji. I was born in Sua, Fiji, right up there until I was about 10. Can I just stop you there, Saf, because I did a Google search the other day and you were actually the second most notable Rutuman on Google behind John Sutton and Jess, <laughs> the great South Sydney rabbit is. And I don't want to steal the punchline of, of a lot of your story, but the second Rutuman ever to play in the NRL, which is an amazing achievement too. Yeah, probably. there's a small population of about 2,000 on Yeah, 10,000 in the world. <clears throat> yeah, so there's more people outside than, than on the island. So, uh, Two out of three at this table. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going all right. Yeah, it's no. sad. <laughs> was born there, grew up, you know, fairly comfortable life in Fiji. My parents had really good jobs, like any other island kid, trying around barefoot, playing touch footy with Coke bottles on, on gravel roads and footpaths. But the other reason why we moved to Sydney is because of the, the coup that was happening in Fiji. Yeah. And my family thought it was a good idea to get out of there. and. Pretty grateful they did, you know, wouldn't have a good life. Whereabouts did you guys initially move over to? Did you stay with family or? We moved to, I think it was my mum's relative. So he was living down in Campbelltown and he already had three kids in, in the household. So we were just made do, you know, sleep on the couch in the, in the living room. They sound like the story. <laughs> Many Polynesians <laughs> they come over that first generation life. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we stayed with them for about maybe six months and then mum and dad found them rental property in Ingleburn, which we stayed there for a couple of years. Ingleburn Bulldogs. Ingleburn Bulldogs. Yeah, I actually played for Ingleburn RSL. I actually never knew anything about rugby league. I didn't know it even existed. I was going to say, because when you think Fiji, you think more sevens, rugby union. Yeah, so rugby sevens was a big thing there. Did you have an idol? Yeah, yeah. Serebi. Serebi. <laughs> with his goose step. So how come you never took on those shrimps? <laughs> <laughs> I think I grew too big for yeah. footwork and speed. I think the first game I ever watched of rugby league was a Broncos game. Yeah. I think they were playing Parramatta actually. They smashed, they smashed Parramatta. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> they smashed Parramatta and uh, I just remember seeing Wendell Saylor and Lottie Takiri on the wing and I thought Wendell Saylor was Fiji and something like that. <laughs> and that big pet. I think you'd claim that if he was in <laughs> Super so I was like, oh, there's three Fijians playing the Broncos. So that was my team when I moved over here, the, the Broncos, because of them. See, that's really cool, because I know in episodes before that, representation has been really important. Like just seeing people that look like you, that kind of moulds like where you see yourself going. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it was a new environment moving over here, so you kind of just try and cling on to something that's mm. familiar to you. What was school like? School was all right. Different curriculum, you know. I wasn't very good at school anyway, so. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask next. Like, I went to school with you for the last few years and so did Timmy. What kind of careers did you envision when you were going through school? Was it always a sporting path? Well, yeah. Well, I really didn't have an idea when I was younger. Just living living day by day at school, you know, <laughs> just, just playing with your mates and yeah. just trying to cruise through class and uh, yeah, pretty much just looking to get outside and play. So we did a bit of moving around from Escort Park to Ingleburn and then we moved to the country for a bit, to Griffith. I was like, I'm going to be the only brown person in the country in New South Wales. And then I rocked up and just saw all these brown people. See, yeah, and yeah, I realised that they do a lot of fruit picking out there, so yeah. that's why there's a lot of lot of them over there. With visa, without. <laughs> hey, we ain't telling them this show. Yeah, no, no, yeah, it really wasn't until I moved to Mount Druitt. We lived there for a, a year. That's when I played from Town City. Uh, I think sad I was about 15. Yeah, sad times actually. I was a winger then. I couldn't crack the forward pack. 
would watch like you know Jersey Fleet games and Premier League games and think like oh this is probably this is what I want to do uh, that's probably when the, the dream took off I yeah. remember playing you and I remember seeing you with your grey head gear I was like hey this guy looks very similar to me <laughs> and you're out on the wing I go why can't I be out on the wing dad and my dad would be like nah you're too slow son <laughs> and I'd see you zooming around out there what made you pursue it even further well I suppose uh, like it started off there I, I always wanted to be a forward it probably pushed me more to to want to get better at footy just because I was I hated the wing I you know wasn't a winger wasn't very quick from there trying to just develop my skills and I remember at that time it was when Sonny Sonny Bill started coming out and yeah. I think everyone wanted to play like him so trying to develop my game around his type of play which you know, it was how things started. The next year, I moved to the Mighty Comet, and I remember it was actually Goddard's old man was coaching. Shout out to Dave Goddard. Dave Goddard, yeah. And I remember the first session, he asked me what position I played, and I said, a front row, as far away from the wing as possible. <laughs> I was definitely wasn't a front row. <laughs> definitely was not a front row, but I thought if I start in the middle, right in the middle, he could only shift a little bit out. He let me play in the front row, and then after a couple of games, he, he said, I'm the second row. <laughs> <laughs> after a few of those runs <laughs> off the kickoff. <laughs> After those kickoff runs, he said, no, I think you're a backer. <laughs> yeah, and then I think my game sort of slowly picked up ever since I went to the comments. Yeah, so good credit the comments for that, I think. I know there's two parts that I see a lot of people take into the top grade. And one is it comes through organically. They make every single team, 17s, 18s, 19s, 20s. And then there's others that maybe fall away, perhaps realise that this is what they want to do, but they, they keep working you know, studiously at their craft. Which path was more so yours? Yeah, so def I definitely didn't make any of the teams until, yeah, probably 18. I remember trying to make Harrow Mats. From where I was at 15 to 16 was a big improvement, you know, jumping into the forward pack. I thought I played well enough to make those Penrith teams, but didn't come about. 17s didn't come about either. So, yeah, I definitely never got picked for, for all these teams. But I, I suppose I just, I didn't dwell on it. Sort of thought, well, what can I do to to get into those teams. I remember we had a little unit in Mount Druid and we used to have tiles, it was all tiled. I would, you know, work ladder drills on those tiles. I remember I could only pass one way, sit, sit down watching telly and just practice spinning the ball in the opposite direction. And yeah. after a while, I'd just try and, trying to pass this pile in the opposite direction, it actually worked. Little things like that I tried to do to pick, you know, sort of pick my game up. And I reckon I'd watch a lot of footy, as I said, you know, Sonny Bill was the big yeah. superstar at that time and I really tried to base my game what he was doing and maybe not put him on those shots I <laughs> <laughs> probably couldn't do that but <clears throat> I remember seeing him he used to offload he still does offload a lot um, I would just sort of mentally put myself in that position just running through my head yeah. you know like footwork push to the line look for an offload and I think the more and more you run it running through in your head it gives you more more of a chance of putting it into action so did a lot of stuff like that how old were you when you were doing that probably when i was 16. back then you would have never thought that was training visualization <clears throat> yeah that's I, I didn't know what i was doing but i just thought you know this is like just try anything to get better at the that's, craft that's crazy cool um, but yeah it really wasn't until probably 18s that mm. i sort of got into it, the system which is I thought back then was pretty late, but looking back now, yeah. getting into the system at 22 is still early, you know, like 23, early 20s. What do you think that drives that, <clears throat> that thought pattern? Is I think as a kid, when your goal is to play in the NRL, you just want to get there as quick as you can. Yeah. And also, you know, you're developing as well and probably think you're ready. Yeah. Like, I think most of it is you, the want to get in and you thinking you are ready to play with men and when you don't get in, when you get cut, you're a setback at 17, 18, a lot of people just sort of say, oh, it's, that's, you know, if I don't make it now, I'll never make it, you know. And that's why I find so interesting <laughs> about what you are saying before and I asked you how old you were because that is such an advanced skill set that a lot of athletes at the highest level would kind of present in that visualisation, especially that resilience. I look at young athletes now, it's probably one thing that is hardest to breed in, into athletes is skill, their skill uptake is really quick yeah. uh, movement coordination mobility just having that resilience when they come against those mental barriers being able to keep persisting yeah. and you spoke to how you practiced and practiced even though you know, that vision wasn't really coming to fruition for you that's yeah, commendable I, I think it was just a natural instinct I think at the time just to really want it more I know people could go either way you know if something like yeah. that happens you could either try again or just you know sort of Awesome. Hang, the boots up, yeah. <laughs> Hang the boots up. But yeah. at that time, that's just my, my thought process was, all right, what can I do to, 
to get better? What, what do I have to do to get into those teams? And then, yeah, it wasn't until I was about 18 that I got into the system. And, uh, what was that like for you? Two years of, you know, three years of trying and then finally seeing my name. I remember we used to have to log on to their website, the Sporting Pulse website, <laughs> and then look for your name. I remember logging on and like getting on and checking and I saw that I made it. It was such a, you know, such a relief. And Was this SG Ball? SG Ball, yeah. yeah. So I finally made the team and I thought, this is where, you know, it's going to kick off. Like, this is the snowball effect. Probably next year at the time I thought maybe play SG Ball, in the same season, I'll play flag and play <laughs> Premier League. Yeah. And, but, uh, you know, that didn't come about. I remember Why? We, we, went, uh, we went to schoolies that year. That was when we finished year 12. And, uh, hey, we use a pronoun that's inclusive. Yeah, it's inclusive. This is you, my man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was in party to this. Yeah, and I went to, uh, for a trip to schoolies. And I remember Penrith only gave us three days up in the surface. And we had booked a week. We had already booked a week. So at the time when I was going up, I was like, yeah, nah, three days, fine. Three days, come back, continue the dream. And then for some reason up there, Everett decided to do the right thing, come back. But I thought, you know, I've booked the, the whole week already. I'll just keep and continue and having fun and then come back. And probably- That would be a common thought about no, lots of young people. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, well see, I, I never really went out kid like the parties and mm. like maybe went to probably at that time year 12 that's probably when I actually started going going to parties socialising a bit more and and then I think schoolies was just like it was such yeah, a big end of an era and yeah. mother like yeah, straight away like, and I was like oh you know <laughs> right I, of I passage. Never, I've never enjoyed myself this haven't kind. stopped here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have I'll have fun and I'll deal with whatever happens and so I remember coming back after that wasn't sure whether I'd still be in the team or not. I was too scared to to call call Alex and say, you know, like, what's the go? Can I come back? Um, so I just left it. I really did leave it home. You went back, and he said to just come back. Yeah, he asked me. He, he goes, where, you? "Where is your Where is your brother?" <laughs> so after I go, "Yeah, he's still around the corner. I can bring him to training." And you were like, "No." Nah, can't. I yeah. Just, why I, do you think you had those feelings? If you because I, I, I think I felt bad. If school is was over. Now getting to go back in there, I was just really embarrassed. Yeah. To it probably says back. a lot about you too that <clears throat> you know you did the wrong thing and you thought, hey, there's got to be some sort of yeah. repercussion to my actions. You took a step back. Yeah, and I thought I thought for sure he was going to let me just come back into yeah. the team. Well, I was cheering. I knew I was going to wear the 12. <laughs> 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 I was thinking, yeah. You're one tall guy. <laughs> yeah, so then that happened, and um, I think the things kind of turned at that point for, for me. I thought, you know, that's the resilience would come in. But then I thought, that's, that's it. Like, I, I probably gave up on the dream after that. I thought 18 was my chance. I got in, I blew it, and then, you know, the, the, only, the, the only next step was to Jersey Flag after that. And that's like a big gap from 18 to Jersey Flag. And I didn't see myself at any chance making a Jersey Flag team. So, so then what changed? <coughs> well, I, I just went back to St. Clair. Like, uh, just started running off me, they great. <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's exactly, girl, yeah. exactly what I did. I, 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 I said, well, what do you I mean? You had a cracker year there, too. Hey, we had a couple of boys, yeah. Matt Moylan, yeah. Zarafa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, A grade team. is still a pathway. Didn't really think too much about how I was going to get back. I was just like, what am I going to do now? Yeah. I still enjoyed playing footy. So, I went back to the old club, the Comets, and I think I played one year of C grade and then made it into SG Ball, cut from SG Ball. <laughs> went back to, to play C grade again, but for that year I ended up just playing A grade for for, for the comet instead of playing C grade. And that year the C grade boys won the comp, which, you know, <laughs> and, I, I did, yeah, and I'd never won a comp. So um, yeah, we got towed up in A grade, but oh, <laughs> I think we lost the semi to get in the grand final. Oh, what's yeah. 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 I went to score four tries against Canberra. I can't remember what you won then. I was like, yeah, no, we had a good year, but like, yeah, we come semi finals, we, we got pinned out. That year playing A grade was definitely started the ball rolling to get back into who were your mentors at that time then to get it going yeah so like you mentioned Alex Chance just retired for the Super League I remember you showing me a tackling <laughs> technique that that he'd employ and you <laughs> <he'd> tell <laughs> me to employ yeah. above the nose above the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember trying to employ it every single yeah. game that season man he, yeah he was a tough player tough, tough man tough I think he was 
<laughs> it was uh, yeah the fish hook, the fish hook <laughs> and then he had the old forward tackle you know yeah. get in there i suppose it's different areas of playing footy uh you definitely yeah. get away with that these days but yeah he definitely um you know just seeing some of that come into the to the team it kind of uh, gave me something to work towards you know. he's able to model those bands <clears> to say yeah. bring it to the club and i think he sort of took me under his wing a little bit and sort of um we at training we'd, we'd practice some you know some tip drills and put in and then coming to to games like i remember i used to make a lot of breaks off him because he'd he'd take the ball up yeah. and draw in three defenders that, yeah. and then just the tip and i'd be through and I, I remember doing that a lot that year but i had a, yeah I, I remember that year i had a really good year didn't think i'd be able to play that well against men you know being 18. So then what was the progression from there? So I remember Matty Mullen played a couple of reserve grade games that year and then a couple of A grade games. I think he was still in Howard Mats. Yeah, he something was, like that. He, he was, was 17. Yeah, 17, yeah. you were 18. He was, yeah, he was still pretty young. And I remember a couple of scouts came to watch him play. I can't remember who we were playing, but it was Jim Jones. Jim Jones came to came to watch Matty Mullen play. And, Pick Matty Moylan up, gave him a shot in some, somehow, you know, I was playing the same game and uh, he gave me a tri trial run with the 20s. I think the 20s had just come in yeah. the year before and he sort of just said, you know, here's a train and trial kind of contract to take that on if, if you wanted. And uh, at the time I was like, oh, you know, like I gave up 18s. One year later, you know, something else came, came about. I went from giving up my chances of playing, ever playing first grade and then just a year later, having fun. I think that was the main thing, just having fun. I went back to St. Clair. Mm. There was no sort of vision to get back into first grade, but just really enjoying my footy, playing with the lads um, at St. Clair. So training trial contract came up. And at the time, I remember Alex um, said to me, he said, if, oh, this is prior to, to that game, he said, you know, if nothing comes, comes about, I could get you a gig in France, you know, like, um, if I was interested. And at the time I was... He's like the GM of Catalan. <coughs> he is now. He? Oh, yeah, so he's, um, I think they got him in to just sort of oversee, yeah. keep control of the players because they were playing up a bit. So yeah, he said he had an opportunity in France. I, we didn't get too far into it to say, you know, who it was or what it was, but he just said, if nothing comes about after this year, there is an option there for me. And thankfully, couple of games later the um, train and trial with Penrith came about looking back now like that would have been great to to travel and play yeah. but at the time there was no way I was leaving <laughs> I was leaving comfort zone I remember when you told me about that actually <coughs> it was it was really cool yeah I was like yes because I'd seen you work and work and work and be playing really good footy and then as your friend I was just so happy for you and I was also excited to yeah, and, and yeah, like it, was, it was good to, like, I w would get to play. Because I remember, I remember you would always always be in those teams and I would want to play with you, you know, and it never came about until probably 20s where we, we played together there. But that's a long time, you know, four, yeah, four or five years. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I took, took up the, the Penrith offer instead of, you know, t uh, going to France. And what was the difference when you came in that pre-season especially, as opposed to when you had that initial opportunity in 18s. You mentioned well, yeah. that fire lit under. When that opportunity came came about, I was like, I'm, I'm not gonna let this one pass, you know, it didn't matter. And I suppose prior to that, I sort of had my fun. I've never seen someone put a car in the way by themselves <laughs> in their lounge room with the lights off. Yeah. And it was Fiji bitter, I think too. It wasn't even something tasty. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember. Still hold an eight pack down. <coughs> well, I, I definitely can't drink like that anymore. But so when that opportunity, I mean, especially playing A grade with the boys of St. Clair. What was that like? <laughs> See, would you like to divulge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't ever think I went to work on a Monday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's too busy at PJ Gallagher's calling me to come pick him up yeah. on a Sunday. Yeah. So. yeah, for that whole year, yeah. I remember oh, it would be. Back to the catalogue, PJ Gallagher's then the cross. Well done. Hey, you missed the Eagle Rock. You missed the Eagle Rock between, <laughs> between the cattle dog and PJ. Bobby Bright, the Eagle Rock. Bobby Bright would be like, if you don't come, I'll bash you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. geez, but, and that's, that, that's another, another bloke, Bobby, Bobby Bright. He, um, Stand he, up loud. Yeah, he, him and Alex really sort of saw something in me that year playing A grade. And so that, that sort of made me kind of believe more in myself that I could 
could do this. You know, yeah. I can play. Yeah, that second opportunity come up in twenties, and I just remember thinking, like, you know, uh, I'll do whatever it takes to to make this team. And, but even then, I had these doubts about, you know, whether I was... You know, Where is that coming from? from? Just because you hadn't done it before? <laughs> yeah, so just because I had never played never played that uh, rep, rep footy before. I know it's one thing to play A grade as, as a young fella, but then playing uh, at a high level where, you know, the skill and the speed of the game is a lot faster. And Once you're amongst it, did you realise, <laughs> say, the physicality is just as bad, yeah, if not less? Is there a moment <laughs> when you realised? Yeah, so it was actually our first trial. I remember we played at... Um, Kingsway and we're playing the Bulldogs. Was we were, we're yeah. playing the um, 20s and before going into that I remember seeing the, the Bulldogs boys come up come out of the bus and walk in and I, I just yeah, remember big, I was like this big skinny, to skinny, I was this skinny lad and all these massive islanders were, we must oh, I must have missed the uh, the big islander jeans because they were so big and then at, at that point I was like I don't know if like, I'm cut out for, for this yeah you know you play men that are big as well but yeah, these these guys were more skillful, strong, and I had these doubts whether I was good enough to play at that level. Probably a couple of runs in, a couple of tackles in, sort of thought, you know, hang on, like, I can hang with these guys too, you know, so, and I don't think I played a really good game or anything like that. I mean, I I think I came off the bench and sort of did what I could with the time that I was given, but uh, in that time I, I went away thinking, I had a chance. Yeah. And then, um, well, Cully, Craig Cullinane was our teacher at school and then he was also the 20s coach. So I had to really work for a spot in that team because, you know, he was our school coach as well. At school, I was playing mm-hmm. second grade. I think I played with Tim. A couple of games. That might have been third grade. That's for school. So you got that game out of the way. Then what did the rest of the <coughs> season look like from there? I think I did get a start in the next trial game. Mm. Some boys were, you know, chosen to back up for first grade. And I was like, man, I, I think I'll... Yeah. I have a chance of playing in that tr- in that first grade trial. I didn't get picked, and I, and after that, it sort of took me back to when I was younger, when I never got picked for the teams, and I was de- I was pretty devastated that I didn't get to p- back up and play. But that sort of sort of fueled me to you know try harder. Played okay, coming to game one. Uh, I think we played the Raiders. I got a starting spot and um, sort of never gave that up for the rest of the. Year. Big you know it yourself, you got player of the year that year, you had a cracker season. But fast forward from there, you then pick up a training trial contract with the NRL? Yeah, so... And this is 2011 uh, it would have been? Yeah, so this is the end of 2010. Yeah, 2010 we uh, finished 20s. I didn't really, didn't really think about what was coming after that. Like, I mm. really didn't think of, think about it until I think my manager at the time was like, well, the parents are offering you, want to offer you just a training trial. Uh, for first grade and at the time I think it was only like five thousand dollars. Good um, money, yeah. Yeah, good money. <laughs> Heaps good. Probably money. ending that a year as an <coughs> apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we laugh about that now, yeah. but like people would think, oh, this guy's training at the NRL squad. Yeah. It's on massive dollars, but it is now. The but back then, but back you know, then, you go yeah. and you're still, yeah. still punching a ticket <clears throat> every day, getting flogged for it with a great opportunity. Yeah. But, you know, it wasn't monetized no. as well. Yeah. As you know, people would have thought, or they would have portrayed it in in media. Yeah, definitely. Because I look at what the guys are now. Like, you're you're on big money just to play reserve grade. At the time, we were we training trial for five for five thousand dollars. At the time, for me, yeah. I was like, I were you working? Care. Were you working also at that time, or you just committed? Uh, no, so I, I did. I didn't work. I, was, I just yeah. committed completely to it, and I remember five thousand dollars a year turns into we get paid monthly. It was like three hundred bucks a month. Yeah. And every time that fifteenth rolled around, you'd be looking forward to that three hundred. But thankfully, at the time, I was living at home. Didn't have to worry about money really. Didn't work as I, I wanted to, really give it a good yeah. crack. Now I look back, I could have worked and still given it a good crack. But at the yeah. time, I thought this is my opportunity to give it everything. Yeah, five thousand dollars. I didn't think twice. I was like, I'll, I'll take it. I know if I just get another good preseason under my belt, good chance of making mm. making the team. <clears throat> so preseason rolled around. It's probably one of the hardest preseasons, but we had some testing. We had testing to do, and um, I remember prior to going to that preseason, we'd do like a lot of weights, and I th- tried to stay um, in the best shape I knew how to be in at the time. And at the time, all I thought was, like, if you become big and strong, you you know, big and You're strong right, translates yeah. into football, and you you'll be good. 
So that's all we, we did. I remember we'd just go to the gym and do bodybuilding weights, try to get big and... Yeah, so pre-season rolled around, we did testing. At the end of the testing, I, I fared pretty well. After that, I, I thought, hang on, like I'm mixing it. Like I'm, look, I'm walking into the sheds where there's, you know, Luke Lewis and Petro 7 Seaver there. And like, you, it was like a bit of a shock. Like we'd see them around when you are in the 20s, but now you're actually training with them. At, so at this stage, I, I was kind of in, in awe and thinking that there's there's levels here, which there was. After that pre-season, it was probably... I think probably the best shape I've ever been been in. Yeah, you look nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the the next the level of um, from twenties to that, you know, they really looked after you and got myself into the best shape that I I could get myself into at the mm-hmm. time. Going into trials, I didn't think I was going to play first grade yeah. at all. And the thought was just to try and get a contract with the team. So uh, at the time, one of the guys we were playing with. Uh, Jesse San Lafayette, he he locked in that back row spot that I was trying to to get for that game, and I, I don't know what happened, but I remember we got into port and something. I think he had uh, a family uh, issue or something, uh, incident that he had to stay, and so he vacated that back row spot, and I just moved into the starting lineup. I got pumped. I knew who it was. It was Antonio Cafusi. He just he just pumped me. <laughs> and I remember after the game, I saw him at the sheds, and he was huge, but he was like ripped as like six pack for a front row. And I think at that time, that's when the front row started to become more. Yeah, the changes leaner. were coming down. And yeah, was... I think that was a good thing for me. I got got you know sat on my back because it. At the time, I don't know, when you get hit like that, it didn't hurt at all. The, the, the Canadian ice hockey captain, Sidney Crosby, his first touch, he got knocked out cold. Yeah. And he reckons that's why he's so good, because he tells himself, can't my first it. touch, I got knocked out, like I'm still alive. Yeah. So yeah. it can't get any worse than that. Yeah, that so. was exactly my thought. Like, first touch, I got hit and flipped. And I, I got up, played the ball, I was, and I, that was it. I got on with it. And after that, and I said, give me another touch. And, I think that sort of changed changed the game for me. I was confident. I was more confident with with how I could play because I wasn't sort of afraid of you know look, getting embarrassed or how it would hurt, affect me, uh, yeah. the impact and all that sort of stuff. And so I thought I had a, a great game. Moving into the next uh, trial game it was the big game. This was the final trial before uh, round one, and I managed to jag a, a bench spot in that team. It was a big, big game at Paris Stadium. It was a packed house, Battle of the West uh, trial game. Yeah. And this was sort of when I kind of thought I'd have a chance of playing. See, that. that's crazy to me. You were <laughs> right there at the cusp of it. Yeah. You preface every single step and stand that you have with, you know, I wasn't too certain if I could, and then I did it. And for me, bro, that's your superpower. You never, ever let complacency creep into your process or as you're building. And I got to watch it. I'm going to gas you up now because I love watching that journey too. But, you know, you say, I was there and I was getting whacked by Kafusi, but still I was, you know, grinding humbly. You know, again, lots of people let complacency creep in. Lord knows I did. I was like, hey, when's my ticket? I'm going to get called up soon come origin time because if I am the you know sort of third string fourth string back row I might actually have a chance of playing this could happen for me come round one I didn't get picked I sort of I remember Guy Guy Messier was saying like you know head up before the game and he was a Premier League coach yeah he was like you know keep your head up you know I know a lot of you boys really wanted to play first grade this week and and this is your chance to sort of put a stamp down on that position for first grade so I remember taking that into the game thinking you know all I can do is play well in reserve grade and hopefully come origin time I get a call up and first grade got flogged and then come round two I remember I was in the toilet and someone patted me on the shoulder it was um, <coughs> Luke Lewis the uh, captain at the time and he said to me look you know whatever you're doing just keep doing it because you're a good chance of playing first grade and this was after round one mm. so I was thinking you know like, I was gained so much confidence out of that and I was thinking well, next week I'll play, try and play well again and who knows. I remember Matty asked me to come and just train with him uh, for the captain job. At, at the time he just said you know like you're gonna you're gonna debut so yeah, I, remember that. I, I, was, I just uh, remember yeah like I was like I couldn't believe it that this was actually gonna happen. Drive home I was like oh 
I don't know who to call. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Who was the first person to call? I, c- I can't even remember. Like, I just remember driving down the M4 back to St. Clair thinking, like, is this real? Like, uh, yeah. I don't know if I was the first person you called, but you told me. I just I say, really, I really couldn't believe that this is actually happening. I, I remember coming on, I think it was the last 20. This is when they're all tired. The game was pretty slow. And I jumped on. It felt like I was playing touch footy. First tackle I made, was, I managed to hang on to Moimo's <laughs> bootlaces. <laughs> Played well, we, we won. So you had that, that amazing <coughs> year, and then at the end of the year, I think uh, you injured your shoulder. Yeah, so I, I had the, the shoulder issue the last half of the year. I was getting a local anaesthetic to, before the game to play. So um, You don't think anything of it, you don't really question yeah. it because everyone's getting it. Yeah. But then you tell people, like I know uh, working in, in a gym mm. context, you talk to people, oh, I used to have cortisone every second week so I could get on the field. Yeah, so that like, was Why it. are you having that? Every second week, well, we would have yeah, yeah. we would have the local, and then every couple of weeks have yeah. a cortisol to to try and heal it, and just masks I think, it really. Yeah, so that what I, that happened in twenties, and then moved into the next year, did this similar thing, and at the end of the year, they said oh, I was probably good to get a check, and I remember I had torn my my labrum. I think it was like yeah. a good four centimeter tear. They said probably should get it fixed, so I said I'll oh, get it done as quick as quick as I can so that would give me good sort of recovery time to get back in for pre-season the next year. Got the surgery and I think the big thing for me was like when I actually played first grade, I think the first game it hit me and I was excited and a couple of games after that it sort of turned into like I, I didn't know what was, like what to do. I'm, I, I'm there, I made it. Where to from here? Yeah, where to. I, I look back only in hindsight that I, I really didn't set my only, hey, goal, no my only goal was to play first yeah. grade. Like I didn't set anything higher than that, you know. And, and then when I achieved my goal, it was almost like, like you said, the complacency just kind of crept in. Like I, I feel like I didn't set, I didn't reset my goals. And then you didn't sit back and readjust. Yeah. So that's one thing I look back and, and that's kind of why I feel like I, I never got to play my best footy in first grade because I played well I remember I played the first couple of games I played well and I managed to get into the starting team and I think that's when it kind of hit me where I was like I'm, I'm starting like where, where to go from here like, so if you had that time over you think you start setting goals yeah definitely I would have set like you know I didn't even try to set like making the starting team I was just content with playing first grade because yeah. that was the goal that I set looking back now I would have you know definitely once I got in there make make the team, make the squad, you know, make the 17 and then make make a starting spot and then from there. Were you asking those kind of questions or you weren't really, I, had that self-awareness no, at that age? No, I definitely didn't have that self-awareness and, and that's probably why I never got to to play my best footy. I, I remember playing footy, I'd never be able to notice the crowd and like, you know, people could be screaming stuff and, I'd, you know, sort of like tunnel vision. And I remember waiting for a kickoff, and I just looked in the crowd. And I could notice everyone, and, and that's when I kind of noticed that I wasn't in the zone to yeah. play. And I remember that game; I had a uh, had a pretty bad bad game. I think Steve Mallow scored four tries down our edge, and I think I had a big part of with those tries. And I couldn't recognise what 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 I what I was doing and what I needed to do to to get better at my game. After that. I uh, just wasn't sure, just wasn't sure what I wanted to do, like, or how to to go about things. The more I listen to people <coughs> tell their stories about, you know, pursuing their goals and their vision, especially around sport, so I've had you know, a whole heap of friends that have pursued that, that avenue. When they reach that goal, you know, and then there's nothing really mm. to follow, I find they look for things to try and fill that void, to try and create a goal <laughs> as as large as the one that they just knocked mm. off. Or, yeah. Were you, were you feeling this? No, the so same feelings, or what was no, your? So I, was, I wish I had that. I had that insight into you know, yeah. like what to do, you know, like how how to be a even how to be a professional athlete, you know. Like yeah. I look back now, and it wasn't until I finished playing footy, like until I gave it up, that I sort of yeah. actually enjoyed training, like mm. the fitness side of it, and um, that's one that's one aspect that I. I, I definitely know I could have been better at. I mean, we'd, we'd go pre-season, in-season, off-season, mm-hmm. just really, I would, the, the way I looked at it is like, I've trained my heart out 
all year, this is my time to enjoy. So and that's I would enjoy, season. Yeah, I would definitely enjoy it. Eat, eat whatever I want to drink, drink a lot of alcohol, go out. And that's a life cycle of lots <laughs> of young athletes, lots of young people. Yeah. They do something and they do another thing that's great. They reach a goal and silly season rolls around and then... I, I just don't think I had a, a, a deeper understanding of what it, what it took to become a professional athlete at that time. And uh, I remember I would try and pick uh, a couple of the boys' brains and what they do during the off season. And I remember they would say like, oh, "Just keep keep ticking over. So yeah. Just do light, like something light. Just run, light ten minute run here and there, a bit of interval training here and there. Nothing massive, but that all, all that's that what that's all that that's all that they did. And then come pre season, you know, there were blokes, you know, some of the veterans that were. 32 and they was coming in in better shape than us but we'd just come in after the yeah. whole off season of enjoying ourselves we'd come back to zero and then probably only took like two two three weeks to get back into good shape but imagine if we came in at like you know sort of 50 percent yeah and then how much better you could have improved in the pre-season and that's one thing I, I, I look back on even though I did get surgery but I didn't have that mindset so like I was in deficit mm. to just being okay and I would still do the same things like come Mad Monday I, I, for, for our team I was in my sling and I had like a couple of cans of uh, Tui's new or Jim Beam and like, while they were playing I was enjoying you know the luxury <laughs> yeah but that's also a culture thing too it's easy to get swept up in that because I feel like at that time I was a part of that culture too you get to the end of the season and you know whether we won or lost pop the bottle and let's enjoy ourselves yeah but you know that's fair enough because it's like Mad Monday see, the mm. end of season stuff but I would continue to do that throughout the off season I remember that second pre-season came in at about 110 kilos I think and then yeah you didn't look too nice <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think you were you were up there with me. I was 116. I think you did your ankle. I, think I did my lateral the year before, syndesmosis the year before that. Yeah. That one there, I did my medial. Yeah, so going into that second season, we had a bit of restructure at the club. The people that knew how I could play... They had been moved along. Moved yeah. along. Mm. And at that moment, I was probably at the worst shape. You know, one year prior to that, yeah. I was in my best condition. I just fast forward, went 360, and at the time, the new coach come in, and, and I think I was sort of third string. He, he gave me every opportunity to, to be in that first grade team. Mm. He, even though he, there were a lot of new players that came in he gave me pretty much gave me that he was the incumbent yeah yeah and and then at that time i just remember uh, looking back didn't take long before i was shuffled down because of my conditioning once we started playing i got injured again pulling up after a run tore my lower ab and that was eight weeks i couldn't do anything and then come back in to play again and sort of just went backwards and that year was probably probably one of the toughest years so that year you don't play nrl that season, I think we both got released from the club. You had our play at Ready. This is where I wanted to get an understanding of what does life after such a great achievement look like for you? Because this is where a lot of people would be at a crossroad now. Yeah, so at the time I was 22, and even then, on the mindset, I, I sort of thought, oh, yeah, so it's, young. It's, well, then I thought, oh man, like, I'm getting, like, this is getting on. Like, I'd, who would want to pick up a 20. 23, 24 year old back into first grade. Now I look back, especially as a forward, you have a better chance making it into, into your late 20s. Mm. So end of the season come around, I couldn't couldn't jag a, a gig anywhere, which was I was dumbfounded on because I was willing to train for free, just get a pre-season yeah. with any club and I, I couldn't get that. My manager said, there was an opportunity up in Queensland, would you like to take it? And I had no other offers. So I took it. It was a good club. At the time, uh, Petro was retired and he was going back to play for Red Redcliffe. And I thought, oh, this would be a good chance to play with him again. So I took it and went up. And at that stage, the dream was still alive. It was only now that I was starting to realise how much more I could have given to footy. I remember Matty Elliott, he was our coach when, when I played. And he said to me, you need to be 80-minute player. And I remember thinking, I was like, man, I'm, 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 I'm Sonny Bill type player. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> that <laughs> ego would get in the way. Yeah, yeah. like this, this is the type of player that I, I want to be like. When I went up to Redcliffe, such a different culture to reserve grade. Training for the Hawaiian yeah. Monday up there. <laughs> yeah. The reserve grade culture up there is like a big thing. They take it very seriously. And, and I remember down here in Sydney, like you'd say like, oh, you play New South Wales Cup and they'd be like, oh, it's, you know, it's rubbish. 
It's not first grade. Yeah. Or Toyota Cup. They think Toyota Cup is above that. But in Queensland, they actually take Queensland Cup seriously. It was like a full-time system in the afternoon. So yeah. you'd work all day. <laughs> what were you doing? Um, I was at the time I was concrete grinding and cutting. Oh, actually, I remember. Yeah. Which was a pretty tough job from you know, from full time keyboard doing that. <laughs> yeah, doing strike yeah. yeah, you train, do weights, and then have a coffee. Like yeah, have a nap, play some PlayStation. Mm -hmm. And it was a big, a big shock being up in Queensland. It was hot. Who's your support system when you're away from home? <clears throat> so at the time, my, uh, my partner and I, we. My wife now, she moved up with me. Is that easy for her? No, I don't think so. A lot of wives and girlfriends are the unsung heroes. <laughs> yeah, so she really sacrificed. She, she actually had just got offered a promotion at, at her job here. And at the time, footy was my job. And this was my opportunity to go up and try and get back into the system. So I was going to take it. And I said to her, you don't have to come if you don't want to. And she, she did. So she sort of sacrificed that to come up with me. We were supporting each other. Well, she was my support up there at work, slave away during the day, which was like a six to three or something. Usually the drives are, are you know, pretty long. So by the time I get back into Redcliffe, I'd go back home, quickly shower, maybe have like a light bite to eat and then go to training. And the training up there was, was something else. I really focused on fitness. So I remember first training session, we did testing, we had to do a beep test. I think I only managed to get like a 10 something in the beep test. And I knew I could get more as you go get into the um, season. But after that first session, I looked around and front rowers there were getting 12. And the, the coach said to me, I don't know what kind of you know, footy you guys play down south, but here at Redcliffe, you're expected to get 12 in the beep test. So that's that, that's the kind of f emphasis they, they mm. held on fitness. And, and I was probably at the fittest I could have been. Definitely, yeah. I gave away a lot of weight. I think I went up there at 108, and I think I was down to maybe 96. Yeah, you got skinny. <coughs> nice yeah. again. So I, was, <laughs> yeah. so I was probably the fittest I've ever been. Like, I, I was playing. Not that skinny is nice. I'm not body shaming no <laughs> one. I, I could play 80 minutes uh, in reserve grade, which I never really did before, because I... Did you see the comments? Yeah, I just saw the comments. Yeah, fit us over. What's your mindset like then? You know, now you work in, you, you realise what the workforce is like, and then you're juggling with SEAL Team 6 floggings in the evening. Yeah. I mean, not being compensated <laughs> the same as what you yeah. would in the NRL. Yeah, definitely. Did, did what, you realise, yeah, what I was yeah. trying to say, did you realise more so... Hey, like the way we, the way I had it, uh, yeah. is so much better than this. It definitely, and it's good. Uh, it makes me the Melbourne Storm, I think, make them yeah. work before. Yeah, you know, that's your favourite team. That's <laughs> <laughs> my favourite response. <laughs> Only once you listen to the whole series, you'll understand the context. Of <laughs> Remarks, and it's gonna be good. <laughs> yeah, I definitely realised how um, I took footy for granted before that. You know, yeah. like you, you had everything given to you. You know, like you just rocked up. This is your program. Uh, when you get paid for that, that was your job, and you do it. You hang around. You get to hang around with a bunch of mates, um, train. It's so crazy because it's a three hundred and sixty from like the start <laughs> of your story where you're saying, "I don't, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think I'm ready." You show absolutely no complacency. You hit the mark. You get to the top, and all of a sudden, see, the, all this complacency creeps in, yeah. and then you know one surgery, and then it's an uphill battle to find your way back into the system. Yeah, so that, that, that's how it felt. It felt like uh, I, I, I was sort of running on a treadmill, you know, and I wasn't getting it anywhere. But that was just my th thoughts at the time. But I, I think yeah, after- Because outside looking in, you're playing good for, <coughs> you represented you can't, you represent Fiji in 2012. Yeah, me looking at it, I thought I, I, thought I had no chance. I was, wasn't playing very well and, and at the end of the season, uh, you know, I had a couple offers from other reserve grade clubs to, mm. and possibly could have had a train. Shout him out. Was it Burley? <laughs> the big money Burley? Yeah. Yeah, a, I knew it. There's a couple there. Yeah, and, and there was probably opportunities there to train and trial, like again. Mm. And, and this is where my mindset at the time, I, I didn't think that it could happen because I, I didn't think I was playing well enough. To, Were to you talking to anyone about those feelings? <clears throat> no, not really, just sort of- You just internalize it myself. off. Yeah, and, uh, um, yeah, and then uh, I look back now, and like, I was playing pretty good footy. Must have lost my number. Of great. And then I, I decided to, to give it one more shot at Redcliffe, because I thought that that's probably the team I want to play for. And that second year I played with them, uh, I, was, I think I was just a bit drained because yeah. work, 
wasn't enjoying footy. Because so hard being away from home? It wasn't at the start because I was driven to try and make it and like it's easy for a guy playing footy to move somewhere else and, and get adjust because you instantly make friends okay, with, with, with the team yeah. yeah and it was more sort of harder for fee but yeah like that second year was, was kind of draining I wasn't really enjoying it purely because of the training so what are the career aspirations for yourself moving out of football and then into financial provision for your family going forward at that point I really had no idea what I wanted what I wanted to do, what my options were. You think that's crazy? Yeah. Like the NRL is one of the biggest sporting organisations. I remember they, they gave you options to, mm. to study yeah. and all that, but at the end of the day, your job is to play footy for them, and that's the sole focus is on that. And then they do f- try to focus on what life after footy, but... The onus is more so on the player, I guess. The, yeah. They yeah. So they give you the option if you want to pursue it or not, it's up to you. And yeah, after, after footy, I suppose, I really did not know what to do. What's well, some of the jobs you were doing, bro? Oh, so I love hearing the strange for some change here. When I moved back, my boss up there really liked me, so he was like, "Every now and again, if if you need, I'll like I'll fly you up to do a job, cutting and grinding, and I'll come back. So I'd go for a weekend to work, come mm-hmm. back, and it'd pay you know pretty well. So I did that for a while. In amongst that, I got a job waterproofing. So I came back. I was doing a bit of that, and uh, my wife's friend. Her partner is a waterproof, and he was like, "Oh, I need a, I need a like a labourer for for a day." And so I said, "Yeah, man, I'll, I'll take it." Like that's the only options I kind of had at the time. And he offered me a job there, so I, at that time I was waterproofing. Every now and again on the weekends, I'd fly up to Queensland yeah. and, and help my old boss out. We doing a, Was that through an apprenticeship that you were waterproofing? No, so what, you don't have to be licensed to waterproof. Yeah. Um, someone does have to be licensed, but you could just be a, a, a trade, for the trades day. assistant yeah. kind yeah. of thing. And, uh, yeah, so I'll, that's what I was doing. Um, and I did that for a year and uh, worked, sort of worked my way into, like I wasn't qualified at all, but it's not, it's not a very hard job to waterproof. You just seal it airtight and paint on this waterproofing. That's pretty much it. What skills were you using from sports? To, to transfer over to, to, to those kind to, of roles. Were you using any at all? Or? Well, actually, you know, it's funny because I look back at every job I kind of do, it's competitive, like in terms of you want to do it quicker or you want to do it right. And That's the way you do anything's the way you do everything. <laughs> and, and so I was kind of doing that. I wanted to be good at the job that I was doing. So I remember after a year, I was kind of like the site supervisor. Was it fulfilling you the same way as playing sports was? Nah, definitely not. I was just doing it for, for income. And still, I didn't know what I want, really wanted to do. Yeah, so I was looking to get out of that. And I remember you said there was, might have been an opportunity to come up at the gym. And I thought, you know, this is quite similar to, to what I was doing before in fitness. And this is something I'd probably like to, to have a go. And, and I think I would like. I started looking at a gym. <laughs> and, and what's the next step for you? Because I know you've moved into a, a new career now. I think I worked at the gym for a Three, three years, just PT and group fitness stuff. And um, I was looking for the things that I might be interested in. So I was just trying to think of ways to, you know, like work for myself. Because that's what, how, what I was doing PT. How I could work for myself in another sort of, with another opportunity. So I would look, at, look into the world. And, and then wellness is a big thing nowadays. So I thought, you know, if I could off, offer maybe co- corporate wellness sort of seminars and that. And that's, at the time, that's sort of my, that was what I was trying to think about, you know, in terms of what I could do next. Were you like looking to just like restart that fire that you had for Lee, like mm. try and find that passion again? Yeah, so that, that's what I was trying to do. Because I was enjoying PTing, like at the time, I thought this is, this is the best job, you know. Like, it allows you to be in the gym and train. Yeah. yeah, and at the time I thought like, it's pretty decent money for what you do. And, the ceiling depending is limit, you, it's yeah. limitless, you know, like depending on you. So I thought that was a good opportunity. And then after three years, I, I was kind of dabbled in a few things and it just wasn't the same. I was enjoying it, but it just wasn't like uh, as fulfilling as it was when, like, say, I was playing footy. So then, uh, yeah, I really wasn't sure what to do next. And just by chance, um, my wife had a word with me and sort of suggested, I think it's time to, you know, get a real like look for like a career don't say like a, a don't career. say it's not a real <laughs> job <laughs> look for the a scalability career. might not be there unless you're an owner but it is a great and fulfilling yeah. job 
And at, at the time, like we had just had our, our daughter, so this is when congratulations we, to <laughs> two years almost. <laughs> Things I never thought about before. She probably had told me it doesn't sink in until like something drastic happens. Like, like yeah. not that it's drastic having a child, but it's a big life life changing thing. And I thought I had a pretty cushy job. Like, but then I started to think like you know I didn't have leave, annual leave. Super wasn't paid. Income is not guaranteed. Yeah. You know, you have to work off of leads and then generate you know yeah. business off those leads. And then it started to sort of creep into my head. Like my, my wife had a pretty good stable job and I didn't have a stable job. My wife asked me to really think about it and then when I started thinking about it, I realised that I needed to, to get a job that would help. What about provision yeah, for the provision family for rather my, than? for my family. And, and then I started thinking about what jobs I could do and I remember you tried to push me into maybe getting a corporate gig. I don't know if that would have been there. helping you though. Yeah, <laughs> but at the time I was thinking like, you know, maybe that, that is... You've been excellent at it too. That, that is a, you know, I have some customer service skills, you know, to do with PT and dealing with people. Actually, my wife actually said, why don't you try like a, like a trade because, you know, that's the kind of jobs you were doing. Uh, there was a, an ad for a, a sprinkler fitting company and then I just thought, you know, a lot of boys do that. Good paying job. Good paying job. Good paying job, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's actually all I remember, it was a good paying job. It said on the ad there that it was, uh, they were looking for mature apprentices. Tall, so, dark and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> well, mature, yeah. yeah. So I uh, thought, well that's me. Um, they're looking for a mature apprentice and I thought, I'll just apply, what's the worst that could happen? So I applied. And then a couple of days later, a friend of ours who just played footy with uh, James, he actually called me and, and said, did you apply for a, a job at this, at this company? And I said, yeah, actually. Uh, like, he rang me first and he's like, is that trying to get a job somewhere? And I think I gave him your number. I'm like, oh, I'm going to call him. Yeah. <laughs> Part of that package too, they opened up your own sports bet account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, just by chance, um, you know, I applied to that company where he was working and, and he's the head sprinkler fitter there. So he's, he pretty much said, you're serious about the job you want it, it's yours. And you know, what's funny, he's, he said to me, when the, um, the manager, he was looking through the applications, he was like, oh, here's, look at these and pick a couple and then we'll interview them. My name wasn't in there. He, he didn't pick mine because he couldn't say my name. <laughs> he, he just left mine out and by chance, Stoney like had, picked it up and saw my name and was like, this is my mate. So I gave him an interview and you know, fast forward uh, a couple of months, I got, I got the interview and, and they, gave, they gave me the job and it's actually nearly a year now I've been doing that. And, and enjoying I, I it? I actually enjoy this job, you know, like... You, I bumped I into you actually on Church Street one time and you were... And <laughs> they can't say it's about <laughs> air quoting, <laughs> working. I went on my lunch break, I just... <laughs> Uh, halfway through like a 12 hour stint. <laughs> 12 hour uh, <laughs> walk, <laughs> lunch break. Yeah. Uh, walk, walk past and Sass putting a spanner or something to the back of a car. <laughs> I go have lunch, come back an hour later, the same spanner still been placed in the back of the car. So, you know, whatever this company is, you guys are doing amazing things to breed synergy and culture amongst your employees. I've never seen them smile Just, so bright. <laughs> Yeah, no, like I actually really enjoy this job. It's one of the highest paying trades too. <clears throat> yeah, it is. So that's that's also, a, you know, a positive uh, why I applied because I knew it was a, a good paying job. I, it just helps that I actually enjoy what I'm doing. I'm still learning and it's pretty challenging. Not physically, like it can be at times, but there's just a lot of things you have to learn. I'm sort of transferring stuff from footy into that is sort of, you know, you have to... Have to learn you have to apply the you know the trade your, your skills you have to keep trying to get better i guess that's what i'm doing now and i know we spoke about <laughs> hindsight before but if we're starting to come to a close here if you have an 18 year old kid and you want to feed him some mental takeaways from your own journey you know, what what do you sit down with that person you know perhaps your nephew your cousin what are you telling them from my experience the goal setting stuff it's good to set goals that align with an end result we're talking crossfit like what you're trying to say i think what well, is matt fraser will never write down he wants to win the games Mm. Like yeah. day one, he wants to train the best he can train. Yeah. At the end of the week, he wants to have like a full week of training. 
and then at the end of the month, let's say you might have them go. Yeah. And that eventually will lead to the goals he wants to get to. Like, you know, people say, if I could go back, I, would, I wouldn't change a thing. But if I could go back, I would change a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, definitely, yeah. definitely the way I prepared myself. And, like, I really didn't enjoy training. Like, I didn't enjoy the fitness. You're good at it, though. I was good at it because it, I had to be good at it to be, to be good at you know, playing. It's only now that I enjoy those kind of things. I feel like if, if I could set these goals down to keep me working at something, even mm. once you're there. Combat that complacency. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's what I do. And also like maybe trying to make sure you see see that goal every every day. See it, you know, not just have it set in your head, but you know, do little things to remind yourself that, you know, this is, this is why you're doing it, uh, what you need to do and a vision and purpose. Yeah. Shout out to Nathan Horner. Has his screensaver on his phone as his goals. That's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Meatball. <laughs> Good work, brother. All right, Rafi. Brother, that's the most words I've heard from you in 16 years of friendship, and I've absolutely enjoyed it thoroughly. <coughs> but as we come to a close, Timmy, you got any more questions in the shotgun seat? No, I'm all good, bro. Just going to give you sign-off. Um, well, well um, my sign-off is uh, you know, thanks to two boys for having me on here. Uh, I hope that through my experience could help you know, someone in the near future in any way, shape or form. You know, and I'm, I'm happy with that. So, yeah, thank you. Bless. <laughs> Sarafu Fatiaki, as we come to a close, it is the great author James Kerr that wrote in Legacy. He speaks of the principle of sweeping and how humility builds a very strong fortitude, and I see that amongst you, my good man. He is Sarafu Fatiaki, the second most famous Shutuman, only behind me on the Google search. <laughs> You're here with Zeb on a Conversate cast. We out! Can we keep this on? It was Tim Good that said, How you do anything is how you do everything in episode one. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. But we edited that out, so it is actually the author that I referenced earlier that uh, said, "How you do anything is how you do anything." Oh, but it is my too good. Cool. It is beautiful. My one gem in that whole combo. No, you got many gems. It is beautiful Western Sydney accent that I've listened to a lot. It says, "How you do anything is, is how you do everything." I couldn't believe.